One other thing I thought of is that we're probably going to be podcasting there. So whenever you and I get to a conference together, we bring all of our recording equipment and try to get a few episodes in. What happened? Nothing happened, as far as I know. <laughs> um, my monitor just turned off. Sorry, guys. I don't. I didn't even move down an inch. Hashtag just gym things. <laughs> oh my god. All right. Just gym's poor technology. Jim gave up. He walked away. He's like, I'm done. <laughs> Mark this down. We, we made it five minutes before we had a gym technical issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am back. Um, so where was I? Well, I'll start yeah, over. Just, you know, I don't remember where I, about where I was. I guess I'll stay close to the mic. You keep bouncing on. around. <laughs> yeah, my, my screen is kind of flickering. So hopefully I got everything set up here. is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad. Yourself? Doing great, man. It's, uh, Definitely summer. Here in Georgia, it was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit the other day or yesterday. And man, I'm feeling it. But fortunately, I work in an air conditioned building and, uh, you know, I, I'm feeling it when I'm outside. And that's for 10 minutes versus I run to my truck that is also air conditioned. And then I go to drive through windows and I can feel the air conditioning emanating from those buildings. So I, I can't complain too much. That's kind of how I feel about like winter is I work when I lived in a wintry area like Chicago, it was, well, I'm inside where the heat is and then I'm in my car where the heat is and then I'm walking outside to somewhere and then I'm somewhere where heat is. So same thing, but yes, definitely hot. Um, I'm in Minnesota today. Uh, so another week on the road for me, but we'll see how hotel Wi-Fi uh, holds up for this episode, but so far so good. Not quite as hot here. My wash says it's 69 degrees here in Minnesota. So Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not too bad. And by the way, Father's Day just passed here in the U.S., and I've received a pretty awesome award. Greatest dad of all time. Mm -hmm. it, it's great because I also got a commemorative notebook, which has all of my past awards. Uh, number one dad, uh, <laughs> best dad ever. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, number one dad, best dad ever, and now the greatest dad of all time. I think that's the trifecta. What do you think? Well, I'm not a dad, so um, I'm I'm feel bad for all the other dads who thought that they were number one. I guess what are they? Are those like uh, you know fake news, uh, false false prizes? Their kids are lying to them. I mean, <laughs> which one of those poisons do you want to pick? I think so. I think they they've been buying the coffee mugs that say number one dad and giving it to their dad, and really they should have been giving it to me. Apparently. I am the greatest dad of all time. Oh, well, congratulations on your major award. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> all right. What else do we got going on? We, we forgot to mention last week, but we're definitely going to beat Identity Week uh, coming up later this year. Identity Week Europe has already passed by the time people listen to this, but we do have a discount code for both uh, America, which is in Washington, D.C., September 11th and 12th. IDAC30 gets you 30% off of your registration, and that code is also good for Singapore which is October 22nd and 23rd. Jim, you and I are going to be in D.C. September 11th and 12th. Um, we're going to start to work on plans in that probably in the next you know few weeks here, but hoping to see some, some friendly faces there. What do you think about D.C. and Identity Week? Well, I think it's going to be hot as heck in D.C. at that time. Oh, wait, September? But you're going to be no, inside. It'll probably be, it'll be perfect weather. Um, I love D.C., there's a few things I really love about it. One is a sandwich shop called Pop Bellies, which I think is in a lot of places, but it's not in it's the southeast. <laughs> it's a That's chain. Like saying, a, a small and, little place like McDonald's. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Like McDonald's is everywhere. 
and mm-hmm. Potbelly's is not here, and I love it. It's not I, okay. I would eat there at least every week if I live there. Um, also, the museums are pretty awesome. Uh, last time I was there, I went to the Holocaust Museum, which is free, and man, it's like it's pretty somber, but I think it's an experience everybody should go through. Um, and then I just feel like you know when you're in DC, like there, you know, there's so much going on. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Plus, I think the conference is going to be awesome. I mean. You know, you've been there before. You told me about it. It sounds like it's becoming one of the conferences people have got to get to and and give it a shot. Yeah, definitely. I think it comes at a good time of the year, too. It's kind of a lull in between, like, Adeniverse, which just took place a couple weeks ago, and then, like, Gartner, which is later in the year. So I think it's really good kind of opportune timing. So, yeah, hopefully see lots of people there that we know. I know last year there was quite a few people there. I was like, wow, okay, there's some there's some names at this conference. So um, I'm expecting, you know, similar and, and or better turnout uh, for this year as well. So that's kind of exciting. But hopefully people take advantage of that. That code's a good way to show uh, support for us. We'll have a link in our show notes so people can, can use that as well. I'm looking forward to the conference in terms of, you know, hopefully we can record a few episodes. Um, and while we're there, I mean, whenever we go to conferences, we bring all of our recording equipment, try to record a few episodes, put out some more additional content for the listeners. And I think people appreciate it because one of the things I noticed is that most of the episodes get a lot of views, get a lot of downloads. So we'll keep doing it unless, you know, we hear from people that it's too much, it's too much, dial it back. It's never too much. You can never have enough identity center uh, in your life. So we're just going to keep doing it. (laughs) We don't do it for you. We do it because we like to do it. No, I'm just kidding. We do it for you too. That's why we started though. We started out (laughs) just doing it because we like doing it. Yeah. I mean, we're going to keep doing it as long as we keep like, keep liking to do it. And we do. So that's good. All right. Uh, Let's get going with the show. Let's talk about bubbles. Uh, Vaguely cryptic topic. Uh, We've got Justin Richer. He's security and standards architect and founder of Bespoke Engineering joining us again. Welcome back to the show, Justin. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jim. Thank you guys for uh, having me back on. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. It's been about a year since you were with us. Um, Mm -hmm. You've already given us your origin story. That was back in episode 222. (laughs) We're on episode 291 now. So we'll point people back if people want to learn more about your background. But um, let's talk about the past year. Um, How's your year been? What you been up to? Anything new and exciting? Oh man, it's, it's been a busy year. So, uh, we had the, uh, Gannett protocol is now with the, um, with the RFC editor. So that'll be becoming a, uh, a final RFC soon. It still takes a while, even when it's at that stage, but, uh, hopefully soon, uh, we had HTTP message signatures, which is another draft that I've been working on for a few years. Uh, that is now an RFC, uh, RFC 9421. Um, and so that's exciting to go, uh, to see go through. And then uh, also in the ITF, uh, we have spun up the Workload Identity and Multi-System Environments, or Whimsy, working group. Um, And uh, that is new work, and I'm uh, helping co-chair that at the ITF. And uh, that we've just gotten that started really within the last year, which is absolutely breakneck speed by uh, ITF standards to uh, get a new working group up and running in that time. That is pretty quick. Congratulations on that. And you've got a great um, acronym, Whimsy, which is awesome. Oh man, it's right up there yeah, with Cheeto I... for Chief Identity Officer. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I can't I can't take credit for Whimsy. Um, we uh, we originally tried to do workload identity in distributed environments or wide, and it turns out that there's a uh, there's already a a project uh, named that. Um, so they wouldn't let us have that. But the uh, security AD came up with uh, Whimsy. Uh, when brainstorming with with a few of the folks that were proposing it so and i i absolutely love it it's give nerds enough rope and we will like we will come up with the most ridiculous set of acronyms that you can possibly uh possibly use yeah but you know what it's all about marketing right if you you have to have a good name for your thing otherwise it'll Mm -hmm. never get traction and whimsy is a great name i I, we're gonna i want to dig into that more because there's another one that you were mentioning before we hit record called Spiffy, which is even awesomer. Yes. So yep. it's like it's, between Spiffy it's and Whimsy and Cheeto, and I'm sure there's other ones out there. Oh right? yeah, Spice like is, is just starting up too. So you know that's a lot, lot of, lot of good stuff. And uh, yeah, naming things is so hard. We'll get, 
We're going to get to that in a second. I want to ask you about Identiverse because I saw you in the hallway. We kind of chatted for a couple minutes there while I think I think I was coming from a recording and walking somewhere and you were sitting in a chair holding court as, as you do. Um, mm-hmm. What did you think of the conference this year? Um, any thoughts? Uh, overall, it was good. Honestly, most of my time I got pulled into hallway conversations this year. It was it was a hallway con for me. Um, just a lot of good conversations with people that are working on lots of interesting stuff. The uh, the big topics this year really seem to be like authorization. Absolutely a big topic this year. Uh, that's really kind of coming out into its own. All the workload stuff, like for example, like we're doing with Whimsy, that showed up in a bunch of different spaces. And uh, so that was, that was really good to see. And it's interesting seeing all of this stuff happen in, um, in a world where like OAuth and OpenID Connect, stuff that I helped like define and, and build, it's not the new stuff anymore, right? That's, that's the old guard. That's been around for over a decade. Like let's, what's, what's next? What are we, what are we building on now? And to me, that's really exciting to see what the new takes are on solving not only the same problems, but also like problems that that stuff just doesn't solve well. It never, it was never meant to solve well. And so, yeah, seeing a lot of people working in uh, just, I, I think we're really seeing a lot of new flourishing ideas in a lot of different spaces in the identity community right now. And uh, most of them are probably going to end up being bad ideas. We don't know which ones those are yet. And uh, I, I think we'll see some really, really cool stuff landing over the next couple of years. That's a good perspective. And I think a lot of the things that you talked about with you know, the whimsy, the spiffy, it all is going to tie into this concept of federation bubbles. Mm-hmm. You're going to kind of educate us on today, but if you start at the most simple level. What is the use case that the federation bubbles concept is meant to solve and kind of how, how did you stumble into this and, you know, tell us the whole, give us the background. Yeah, of course. Um, so the whole concept, uh, I'll, I'll start with like what an idea of a bubble is, and then it'll make sense of a little bit more of where it fits. The idea of a bubble is that you have a network of systems wherein, um, everything is just kind of self-contained. So you have accounts that work, applications that work, authorizations, all of that. And then you have controls about how stuff gets into that system and how stuff gets out of that system. So how I provision accounts in and how I can use that as a launching point to provision stuff outbound. Now, where this really uh, ends up being pretty useful is places where you have disadvantaged environments. Um, So you have systems where you might lose network connectivity. Uh, One of the places that, so I've been working with Uber Ether on this project for about the last year or so, and they do a lot of uh, Department of Defense and sort of forward deployed type of stuff. This is cases where you literally have a bunch of people on a boat and then that's going to go sail off and you're going to be outside of satellite coverage, outside of connectivity range. Uh, or even when you do have coverage, the latency is so high that traditional federation concepts and protocols just don't really don't really work anymore. Like bouncing somebody back to their home IDP back on their, you know, their base or back at, um, you know, DOD somewhere is not not really going to work because it's going to time out before it ever it ever returns. And um so you need to have a system that works within this sort of sometimes disconnected environment. The other thing that got me really interested in this is that years and years ago, uh, you know, several several jobs ago, um, I uh, was working at a company called MITRE, and we were doing a lot of rural search and rescue work. Uh, at the time, I was doing uh, interface design for um, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, we would, drones, we would call them today. And... Um, one of the things that uh, we found in that environment is that we would go work with these groups that you got a whole bunch of people that just kind of show up uh, to help with a rescue operation or help with disaster recovery. And you might not be able to identity proof these people. You might not be able to tie them back to anything in particular. But you know what? You're here. You can hold a shovel. That's good enough. Here you go. And we really felt that uh, in going into this bubbles project, we really need felt that we need to be able to extend that into the digital space. Like you're showing up and the fact that we are together in this same space means that like, I trust you enough 
for right now to do something. And that trust didn't come provisioned from some central system that said, oh yeah, you know, you're, you're down here in this, uh, in the same area that this other person is going to be. And so you can work together and here's all of your policies and here's all of your accounts and all of that. It's like, no, we just showed up and we might not have even known that each other was going to be there and we're going to figure out how to connect. The thing is we do this type of dynamic connection all the time today, but the way that we do it is that people show up and we just hand them a username and password on a sticky note and say, Hey, this is your account. And, uh, and we're going to burn that account when, uh, when you leave or when we remember at some point, hopefully in the future. Um, and the thing is like, we're doing that same type of thing for people that we've, that just rolled up off the street and people that we have a longstanding relationship with. And occasionally people that are actually are provisioned in our sort of larger environment. We just don't have the latest updates yet. So we're treating all of these accounts exactly the same, and they end up all basically in this muddy mess that occurs out in these uh, sort of edge environments. And so what we wanted to do with this concept of a bubble is like embrace that mess and figure out like what does it actually mean to work within that type of system? What are the constraints here that we need to, to work with? But also on a very practical level, what does it mean to onboard somebody into that from a trusted domain, from an untrusted domain, from no domain at all. And what does that look like within these systems once we actually get all of those tied together? So it's the idea here to have like this, I don't know, serendipitous IAM force field that sort of gets er er erected for a short time. Is it something that's a little more permanent maybe based on location or use case? Like help me understand like how these little bubbles, is it one bubble or are these bubbles connected in some way? Oh, there's many, many, many bubbles. So the idea is that um, we want to really draw the perimeter down as far as we can. And so that when we have one of these groups that's uh, going out into the field, we create a bubble for that and we provision into that bubble all the stuff that we know ahead of time. It's like, we might have 20 accounts that we know are supposed to be in there. So we can drop those in there. We can drop default policies. We can drop all sorts of stuff into that, create this entity, and then send it off. Now, what's important here is that this creates its own separate entity and managed space. Because a lot of people that are listening right now are probably thinking, oh, okay, what we're talking about is I have an IDP. I have a user data store. I'm going to create a shard. I'm going to just shard my... ID system and you get a copy and you get a copy and you get a copy. And then eventually we just need to reach some sort of consensus mechanism about any updates and then it'll all be fine. It's a, it's a synchronization problem. But what we found is that that doesn't take into account the type of dynamism that you actually see out in the field where you've got people coming and going, you've got people making these real runtime decisions that it's not that I don't have the latest policy to address this. It's that the policies never thought of this. Uh, they couldn't predict this. But I am in a position out on the edge where I need to make a decision. And so what happens historically is that this is why people create admin accounts with the password admin, because they just need to be able to override a couple of things locally just to get something done, because they're out there in the edge and they need to do something. So, you know, let's go back to the um, to the disaster recovery scenario. Um, you're out there and you've got a bunch of people that show up out of nowhere and just want to help. Uh, you got a, a group of people that roll up in a pickup truck and say, hey, we're electricians. And you can say, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I like nothing is on right now, so I can't actually check that. But you look like you have electricians tools. And you know what? I'm going to assign you to go you know, to, to clear out, to go clear the wiring on that block and hand me whatever credentials you have. And we will clean up the mess later of authorization and everything else. We will figure this out later when we actually have the time, because right now it's more important that we get people who can hopefully go do things out there and working to try and help us out. And, um, and it's the same type of thing that happens in all of these types of environments that we're looking at, like, we have some type of local information 
that wasn't accounted for that, you know what, I'm going to make a decision right now and I need, to, I should be able to write down why I made that decision. What was the provenance of that? What was the input to that decision making? And then push that out into some type of auditable log so that when I do reconnect, it's not just, oh, just give me the new copy of everything and that wipes out all of the local changes that I made. No, it's like, hey, here's the set of changes that I made, right? Here's the set of uh, decisions that I made locally. And maybe some of those are going to be like, oh, wait, those three guys showed up. Yeah, they don't actually have journeyman's licenses. So go send a licensed electrician to check that entire block that we assigned them to, to make sure that that is actually correct. Because that is a realistic way to deal with that type of, um, you know, breach effectively that we've given somebody access to somebody to something that they didn't necessarily have the right to. But given the context, it seemed like it might have actually been a good idea for us to do that. So, Justin, is Federation Bubbles a concept? Are you working toward it being a standard or is it a product or is it? all those things at once? Uh, that's a great question, Jim. Um, so I will say it's not a, it's not a product or a single standard. I don't think that there is a, that the solution to this is going to be a single protocol stack. And I can talk about that more in a little bit. Um, it's a, uh, it's a proof of concept, uh, that we've been building out in, uh, in different layers and pieces. Uh, so for example, we've got an identity provider just to make things very concrete. Uh, we uh, we built out an identity provider that the first time you log in, um, you give it your identifier. If it doesn't know you, it goes and figures out where your home IDP is, does a dynamic connection to that. You log in from your IDP. And then you immediately, immediately get prompted for a WebAuthn credential. And then the next time you show up at that same IDP with that same identifier, you're only prompted for the WebAuthn credential. Because we've already gotten all of your attributes from the IDP. We have already, like, we took that step of validating your account. All we need to do now is log you in. And we have the machinery to do that locally without having to reach back out across the network every time. So we do that heavyweight federation operation as an onboarding exercise. And then from there, we are just doing an authentication operation. And there's some fantastic technology that lets us do that in a way that's secure and you know user-friendly and all of those good things uh, today. On top of that, we've also built out uh, with these prototypes at, U at Uber Ether, um, these trust bundle domains um, to allow you to, to address these different systems. So one of the things I mentioned is that, you know, we, think that there's going to be a lot of different bubbles out there and they're all going to be sort of coming from different trust routes and they're not all tied to the same route. Uh, so you've got folks coming in, you know, going back to the, uh, to the military side, uh, folks coming in from the U S from the UK, from, uh, from France, some other, some other partners coming in, they're all going to be having their own trust routes, their own policy routes, their own account routes. It's ridiculous for us to assume that they're just going to want to synchronize everything into our system so that so that ours work, especially when we are not willing to synchronize our stuff back out into their systems. And um, and it's funny, as soon as you bring that up as an option uh, with a lot of people in the space, you get like the looks of shock and horror are like, like, why would we ever do that? That's a security risk. That's a privacy risk. We would never do that. It's like, OK but you're asking everybody else to do exactly that in order for these things to work. And so, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I want to ask about that item about um, people not trusting the sync backwards. I mean, it seems like if you're establishing some sort of IAM bubble, why wouldn't you want to sync back some of that data or some of those attributes for future use? Maybe it's, hey, we, this guy is a license, we've verified it here. Would you want to carry some of that information forward? I mean, I'm trying to think of like, obviously the security aspect of it, but mm -hmm. I would think enriching data is generally a good thing, no? Well, yeah, and in the bubbles construct, it absolutely is. We would expect these bubbles not to just be, you know, input only uh, views of the world because they're out there collecting all sorts of information that is going to be useful to other parties in the network. 
And so we would want that to not only propagate back up any type of tree, um, but we would also want to be able to share that out to other peers. So uh, let's say, for example, um, you know, we're we're a U.S. thing and we we show up, we've got our bubble and uh, one person comes over from the U.K. and we onboard them into our system. And then then we go and uh, we connect uh, our system out to the French system. And we can say like, oh, hey, we have this we have this Brit with us and we validated it. Here's our record of the validation that we did. Um, and we can assert that out to you. So in other words, we're kind of doing a, an identity proxy at this point, but it's not, uh, it's not the traditional real time online proxying where you're sending them out to the IDP and then to our IDP and then to the other system all at runtime. It's, we did that once we wrote it down. Here's the record. If this is good enough for you, then great. Trust it. If not, there's a record in here that says, hey, that's where this person's IDP is. So they might connect out uh, to the French system, which then says, you know what? Okay, fine. For today, we'll let you in. But if you want to come back tomorrow, we need to talk to your IDP. Once we're back online, we're going to talk to your IDP to make sure, really make sure that that is the right type of connection. And this is that type of data augmentation that uh, is really, really rich that ends up getting just completely sort of chopped and lost in systems today. Because right now, like I said, what happens is somebody like that shows up. It's like, oh, fine, we'll just make them a local account so that, that they can log in. And then and then you lose that entire chain of information, right? You lose all of that rich information. So now when it goes to, uh, for example, audit things six months later after all of this is is done you you can say well i there was somebody that made a local account named jay mcdonald we don't that's all that we have you know he did a bunch of things we don't know what that means um whereas opposed to like no this is jim he came from here uh we onboarded him on this date we checked the provenance on these on these dates and these are the things that he did within the system and it's like, oh, by the way, when I'm back online and I'm doing this sort of, um, it's not, it's not really a reconciliation in a classical data sense, but it's kind of a this this reconnection exercise. I can go back and say, oh, like, hey, um, Jay McDonald came from you guys. He did some shady stuff, and this is the nature of the shady stuff that happened. You might wanna, uh, you might wanna look into that account a little bit because we had to like. We had to like shut him down and cordon him off over here uh, for a little while. And that might be news to, to Jim's organization, or that might have been why they sent Jim. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's we, just Jim. That's know. just Jim doing Jim things. <laughs> exactly. It's sorry to, sorry to pick on you, Jim, but, um, you know, uh, just to make it just to make it really concrete. Um, these are the types of like really local, really individual types of decisions that we, we've got to make. Um, and this notion of, oh, we can just centralize all of our, uh, identities, uh, that really starts to fall apart. So to, to the synchronization thing, that is absolutely key to the whole bubbles concept and prototypes. Um, it is antithetical though, to an identity shard, because, uh, if I am only supposed to have my subset copy, my subservient copy of some portion of the IDP, well then what are all of these other accounts doing there? That's, that's aberrance. That is, you know, I'm going off of what I was told was okay. And now synchronizing with all of that, does that mean that I'm supposed to just throw that out? I'm supposed to eject all of these people that I've onboarded. Um, cause if you tell me to do that, what am I probably going to do? Just go make new accounts as soon as the synchronization is over. Right. Because people need to get things done at the end of the day. Um, this And this goes back to something I, I know I mentioned in the last show. I very, very deeply feel that security needs to serve functionality. You know, it needs to be there to protect systems, absolutely. But it's only as good as the functionality that it enables and not the functionality that it prevents, not the attacks that it prevents, not the you know, the, the off label stuff that it prevents, it's only as good as the positive functionality that it enables. Well, you're talking about the, the usability of security, which I think is, is hugely important, right? It doesn't matter 
how many rules do you have if they're not designed around humans? I think it's, makes mm -hmm. it just that much more difficult to comply with. I want to ask you one more question about the bubbles, because now you got my head thinking here about these different kind of use cases. Can two bubbles merge to form a bigger bubble? So in that example that you used of like, okay, well, here's you know, the US and England and then France. And what if the US and England are working on one thing and then they kind of are working on the same thing? Would it become one big bubble? Would it be two little bubbles that are kind of federated to each other immediately? Like, how do you see that kind of use case taking place? So I, I, I see it happening in two potential ways. Although I think we'll see what it really looks like once once this type of thing is deployed and people start throwing it up against the wall to see what breaks. Um, but where I see it happening is in that type of scenario, I think that if you have an environment where you have uh, two existing groups that need to come together to work on something together, you create a new bubble for that working together portion. So either one side or the other is going to host it or you're going to create a new environment where all of this actually happens. And we see that pattern in the research and academia world uh, with virtual organizations and like people will go stand up a lab that is, you know, a partnership of seven different universities and a bunch of commercial firms and some government funding, right? Like that's, that's exactly the type of like weird collaboration that we should be taking inspiration from. Now in the academic world, the assumption is that you're online so that you can check IDPs, you can check account records, you can do all of that type of stuff. But if we take that type of dynamic environment and move it into this space where it's a lot more dynamic and it's not like we can't really sit down and plan this over a, a bunch of grant writing sessions, um, we just kind of have to make it happen. Like that's the type of space that I'm talking about. Um, so to me, I think the most sensible thing would be for a, uh, these organizations to create sort of a new bubble that, um, running somewhere, it almost doesn't matter where at this point, but it gets onboarded by members of both of those bubbles into that space. So now you have this separate independent environment, uh, that is then sort of parented to two other places. And it knows how to talk back to both of those, uh, both of those other domains. And immediately you can start to see where the shard thing doesn't work anymore because like, this is not a subset of either of those. It is a subset and union. And this is the type of math that doesn't work with trees, right? Uh, they, they get too, too tangled with each other. Like this, we are very deeply into graph territory now. Hey, Justin, you mentioned a company that you're working with on this Federation Bubbles concept, uh, Uber Ether. I've never heard of them. Uh, what do they do? So Uber Ether is a uh, technology integrator in the U.S. Uh, they do a lot of work on the federal government side, um, a lot of identity platform type of stuff. So uh, a lot of government agencies, um, you know, don't have the uh, don't have the IT depth to go and stand up a secure identity system, Uber Ether will run that. They don't actually, uh, they don't have an identity, sort of a core identity product like a ping or forge rock, although I guess that's the same thing now, um, or, or anything like that. But, um, but they will give you a platform that runs that and sets that up with all of like the provisioning and all of the bits and pieces that make the most sense for that given agency and organization. And a big part of this, uh, a big part of what uh, they've been working on is stuff with the Department of Defense, which, as you can imagine, uh, both needs pretty advanced functionality and is also, quite frankly, 20 to 30 years behind the times in terms of uh, this notion of what uh, what technology we actually feel like running. Um, uh, like I mentioned, I used to work for a company called MITRE. We did tons of work with uh, the U.S. federal government. Uh, I was on the research side, but I still touched a lot of the customer side uh, stuff while I was there. And um, I remember back, um, I want to say this was like, this is about 10 years ago now, but talking with a government uh, group even then, and they were like, well, we just heard of this new thing called SAML. 
and we're thinking hmm. about using it, but we're not sure yet. And the reason for this is that these systems move very slowly. Um, and some of that's a good thing because it's a little bit more predictable, but it also, you, you lose out on a lot of the like, well, we need to go solve all of these problems and we're trying to do it with, uh, with this technology that has been around for 30 years, it's, it's a really difficult mismatch. Um, so, uh, anyway, Uber ether, uh, will basically build and run, um, modern identity platforms, um, for all of these different groups. They specialize with, uh, with the federal stuff, but it's not just necessarily that space. Cool. Um, so you had mentioned a couple of standards. I wanted to talk about those. The first one was whimsy. The second one was spiffy. Can you kind of give us the overview of what they do and maybe a, a, an add-on of what the tie-in back to Federation Bubbles was? So starting with whimsy. Yeah, of course. So um, they're actually they're actually related. Um, so whimsy is the workload identity and multi-systems environments uh, working group in the IETF, the IETF being the standards body that gave us things like HTTP and OAuth and TCP and TLS and all of these other great acronyms. And um, what we're doing with, uh, with Whimsy, uh, which has to be one of my favorite acronyms to date, is um, we're trying to look at the space of workload identity. So let's say you're out and you, you need to spin up one of these, um, one of these bubbles. Well, that's a stack of software and all that software is just going to be kind of like waking up and just like in its environment, you need to know that, uh, your database is connecting to the right things that your, uh, your API processing is going through all of the right channels that your filters are all lined up in the, or in are lined up in the, in the right ways that everything is running software that actually has a good software bill of materials to it, that all of that's been verified and validated. And you need to be able to secure and reason about all of the connections between all of these uh, pieces. Well, solving that is actually where, uh, solving parts of that is actually where Spiffy comes in. And um, I always forget what Spiffy stands for. It's secure something identity for everybody. It's S-P-I-F-F-E. We'll have a, a link in the, in the show notes, I'm sure. And... Um, and what Spiffy does is that when a piece of software wakes up, sort of the environment around the software says, oh, here's your identity. Here's your, um, your credentials for calling other people. And importantly, here's the set of things that you trust. So it's this bootstrapping of trust at a very, very fundamental software level at runtime that Spiffy solves. What we're doing with Whimsy is saying like, okay, so we can get that part and we know how to talk to different things in terms of like OAuth authorization or, um, you know, uh, user identities coming in or credentials coming in. How do we start to reason about systems as we connect them all together? And especially as we cross security boundaries, um, you know, it might not be enough that it's just, oh, this one workload is connecting to this other workload and they're allowed to do whatever they're allowed to do. I might actually want to know that in order for this one to call the second one, well, something else has to have been called first. Maybe that's an auditing system, uh, or maybe that's a, a very specific gateway that that request has to come through before this is even allowed to talk to me. Now, in today's systems, a lot of, a lot of stuff is like you're down here on the leaf node and you're like, oh, well, if somebody's calling me, everything must have gone right. And so I can just trust that everything else happened just fine and then I'm just going to do my little job and then that's it. Obviously, that's very fragile. Uh, and that's a very sort of, you know, harden the exterior and keep the inside soft and squishy type of uh, type of thinking. As we move towards uh, smaller and smaller boundaries around zero trust thinking, we need to be able to say like, okay, not only is the correct party calling me, they're calling me in the right context. It came through the right call chain. Uh, which may actually not even be a single linear chain. You know, it may have graphed off into a whole bunch of different systems before it ever got to me. If I can quickly check that against uh, something that said, here's the th list of things that you trust, here's the policies that you're supposed to check it against, 
well, then I can actually make some real determinations about what I'm supposed to be doing here in this system. And that's the type of stuff we're doing in Whimsy. So how this relates to bubbles is we spin up this bubble and yeah, we need to be able to identify all of the pieces that are running inside of it. But also I think that there's a lot of applicability at a more macro level. Because once I spin up one of these bubbles, well, I'm going to want to be able to talk to other bubbles. That means I need to be able to address another bubble. When I send a user, so I've got this Jay McDonald guy that I'm sending over to you and I actually got his account from somewhere else. Well, I need to be able to say somewhere else in a way that makes sense to you. I need to be able to say through me in a way that makes sense to you. And we can't just assume that everything is on a publicly available web-based URL, um, like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the federation, uh, systems that we, we have today, uh, actually do. One of the things that Spiffy gives us is a way to build out URLs within their trust bundles that, uh, that actually makes sense contextually. And this actually brings up a, uh, a really, really interesting um, tie-in from the very beginning of the show is the award of the greatest dad ever, I believe it was. And here's the thing. It's absolutely reasonable. I think we all know uh, that it's absolutely reasonable for every kid to give their dad the greatest dad mug because that is a contextual assertion right greatest dad of all time is a contextual it's the only dad you know <laughs> exactly and so that is the bit uh that makes that truly meaningful it's not actually a global declaration as much as we love we love to joke about that like i i, I love that joke it's a great it's a great standby it's really wonderful but the truth of it is that just like in all of these security systems it's contextual like I might be uh, needing to make a decision about what to do next based entirely on only the things that I know in my environment. And I might have some policy that says only the greatest dad of all time can call this API. And, um, and when he does, then, then he gets the data. Everybody else, I just give him a 403 and say, nope, not going to happen. Thing is, how do I determine that? How do I determine the validity of that assertion? It's probably going to be, it's only asserted by people that I trust to make that particular assertion within a context that I am uh, comfortable with validating it in. And that's the reality of all of these security systems that are out there today, whether we like to think about it that way or not. I think we're too quick to say like, oh yeah, we're going to solve things on a global scale of like, We'll have an authorization policy for every system that we deploy. And it's all going to be the same. We're going to manage it centrally. We're going to have like a cedar file that we just send out to everybody and it's just going to work. It's like, okay, that's, that's going to get you some distance of the way, but eventually down there at the nodes, um, I'm going to need to be able to decide, well, you claim to be the greatest dad. Do I believe that? Like who said it? Where does that come from? And yeah, if your kid's, tells you that that's great if a random stranger on the street handed you that i think it would be a much stranger type of conversation than hey, what uh, i do in my own time is my own business Justin. you know no judgment here no judgment but um um but really uh th that's really one of the core things here is that we're embracing that contextuality we're embracing that messiness at the edge and just admitting that it's there and admitting that it's not part of a problem, but it's just, it's part of the world. That's just how this works. And so by no longer pretending that that's not part of this overall conversation, now we can really start to make some smart decisions about it. You know, we can really start to think about how we process these things, how we talk about these things. Cause I can now actually say like Jim's kids called him the greatest dad. That is a that is an assertion that I can make, and you can do with that whatever you like. You know, I can I can check the provenance. That might be good enough for me. That might not be good enough for you because we're operating in different contexts. 
And um, I need to be able to make those statements and reason about those statements in a way that crosses boundaries in a way that actually makes sense. So Spiffy solves the identity piece just for that running bit of software. Whimsy's looking at how do we reason about this across multiple systems, um, especially across security domains. And the bubbles concept is really looking at that at a uh, that's same style of thing, but at a macro level. Um, you know, how can I have an identity system that I know is independent and that I, that I treat as independent and that is not always connected, but is not always disconnected. Cause like when I come back online, like you were saying, Jeff, I want to be able to say like, Hey, these three electricians came on. Can I double check all of their credentials right now? Okay, great. Thank you. Right. I want to be able to do that kind of thing and not just sweep all of that, uh, under the rug. Yeah, it's a real interesting concept. I'd be curious to see how it continues to evolve. And more importantly, how does this actually make it into the real world, right? From a thought experiment. And and I, I would assume there's probably stuff that's happening, but it oh, seems yeah. like it's very much still on the upward trajectory of figuring things out, right? Absolutely. We're building it in bits and pieces, um, figuring out where the technology gaps are, uh, deploying it where it makes most sense. And one of the things I've said from the very beginning of this is that it's it's not a product, it's not a technology stack, it's not even a standard. Um, because there have been attempts to have like a global vision of distributed identity systems. And it's like, well, if everybody would just use this agent, then all the problems would go away. And that's just, that is never going to happen. Because as soon as you want to connect to somebody else, they're going to be using a different agent, right? They're going to be using a different schema. They're going to be using something that's not the same. And so the interoperability here, I think needs to be about as messy as, as it, it, it can be and still connect, uh, because that's, that's how human systems work. So I'm looking forward to the next RSA where we start to see products with, you know, 100% more bubbles or something like that. <laughs> just like we saw with the you know, AI and zero trust and right. all that other stuff. Um, I want to wrap up our conversation on a lighter note. And I'm happy to say that I am a sponsor or contributor or funder. I'm not sure what the right word is. Backer, mm. I think it's probably the right word. Backer, yeah. Of a new board game that you um, had been working on called Natural Ball. Talk about that because I'm going to link in our show notes. It sounds really cool. And I also want to get into Cards Against Identity for, for a couple minutes. But tell us about Natural Ball. What is it? Yeah, well, um, so one of the things we talked about last time is that uh, w one of the other things I do beyond all of this identity stuff is I really enjoy board games uh, and I've and, you know, I like designing them. Cards Against Identity is something that I've uh, I've published a new version every single year um, over the last five years or so. Uh, and that's been a very small uh, sort of niche thing that that shows up at the identity conference circuit. Um, but uh, with Natraval, um, this is a game that actually came to me through a friend of mine who I met in, um, she's based in Iceland. And uh, she came up with the original idea of this game when just talking with her kid, who was, I think, nine or 10 at the time. And he just wanted more facts about animals. So like, hey, mom, can you just make a bunch of animal flashcards? Or let's make an animal game. Let's do something. And so she came up with this idea of basically having animal flashcards with a bunch of uh, statistics about the animals on the cards and then rolling dice to compare the statistics. Very simple rules, very simple mechanics, really easy for kids to pick up and learn and play. Um, she showed me this game a couple of years ago and uh, it had been sitting around in the back of my mind like, like there's this, there, this is a neat idea. Like this is, this is pretty, pretty neat. Now she had been... Uh, just printing things out on her home printer and, uh, you know, putting contact paper over them. Um, because I had been doing uh, game design and prototyping for a couple of years, I actually printed up, I went and designed and printed up an actual prototype, uh, sent one copy to her in, uh, in Icelandic with the condition that she translated into English so that I could also have a copy. Um, and then we had those for a little while and uh, we're playing with, with our kids and with friends and stuff. And both of us were like, this is, this is a fun game. Like this isn't just like a, a neat little hobby. So we want to make this into like a real commercially available board game. 
So what we're doing right now is we're trying to raise uh, enough money through uh, what's basically pre-orders with a bunch of extras um, through GameFound. Um, and uh, like Jeff said, you can find the link in the show notes. And the way that it works is if um, if we reach our goal by the end of it, then we are going to get a full set of these games printed uh, from an actual game manufacturer. Uh, it's actually the same printer that does uh, Wingspan and Pandemic Legacy and Gloomhaven and a bunch of other like really big games. They are they Those were legit. Really, yeah, yeah, they were really excited to work with us, little indie developers. It's a it's a team of three people total, um, and uh, that's that's been working on this. Four, if you count uh, my friend's son, um, who's uh, arguably the original uh, designer for this whole project. Um, and uh, and yeah, we're trying to uh, we're trying to kick this off. And um, so yeah, please check out the game. Uh, I spent way too much time putting together the uh, the little uh, pitch video uh, that's on that website. Um, so and uh, that runs until I think mid July. Um, so if you uh, if that sounds interesting to you, or if you know somebody it sounds interesting to, please check it out and send it along. Yeah, we'll have a link in our show notes. I'm a backer. I bought one for myself and one to give to my local um, community thing. I think that's still to be determined, right? How you like determine where where the extra copies will go. But yeah, so that is that is something um, that we're doing with this because it's an educational game. Um, we're giving people the option to uh, basically pay for extra copies that then get donated uh, and shipped out to. Um, to schools, to libraries, to community centers, to all sorts of things like that. So, um, so yeah, you can get you can get a copy for yourself, um, and there's a bunch of extras that you can do too. Uh, like our artist is uh, um, is going to be like sketching animals for people, or you could actually design a card uh, to go in this. So we've got friends who like uh, people have already contacted us that they're getting like their friends' pet cats on a card in this. Um, with whatever stats you want. We don't care if they're accurate at that point. Um, and um, so like my kid's hamster is probably going to be uh, going to be one of one of the cards. Um, but yeah, uh, in addition to all of those extras, uh, we're we're letting people sort of donate this uh, to spaces that wouldn't have the opportunity to just go out and buy a $20 board game. Um, and uh, and that's something that we really uh, we, we felt really strongly about going into this. Yeah, it's a very cool idea. I love the art style of the direction of it. Like I said, I've, I've, I bought two. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting that one out. Uh, cards, against, uh, cards Against Identity uh, real quickly. What's the latest on that? Was there a new pack for this year? I, I don't. I forgot to ask you Identiverse about it. But yeah, so there was a new pack this year. Um, I. Uh, uh, so it's one of those things that if you catch me on uh, on the spring identity conference circuit, um, then I usually have a backpack full of them uh, with me. Um, those sold out um, uh, through the absolute gauntlet that was Identiverse, immediately followed by EIC, um, plus a bunch of other stuff around that time. Um, but you can go to cardsagainstidentity.com, um, and that will actually... Um, you can uh, you can buy it online. Uh, since that's a small run, it's a it's basically goes through a print on demand service. But you can get everything all going all the way back to the original 2019 uh, 2019 deck. What's your favorite white card and black card for this year? For this year, oh my gosh! Um, so I think my favorite black card is. Um, uh, that's it. I'm creating my own standards organization with blank and blank. Um, and white card. Oh my gosh. Uh, there's so many different, there's so many cards now across all the years that, uh, I have to remember. I, I will say my, you know, instead I'll give you my favorite white card of all time, um, was from a couple of years ago was the super Vittorio card. Um, as, uh, <laughs> yeah. as, uh, you know, there, uh, there was somebody in our community, an absolute giant, uh, Vittorio Vittorci. Um, and, uh, there was, there's this video that's still on YouTube of him as a superhero anime character. And I was able to actually clip that from the video 
and get that onto uh, onto a card. And that, that I don't think that one's going to get replaced as my favorite card for a very long time. That's a tough one to top for sure. And well earned yeah. too, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, okay, why don't we go ahead and wrap it up, uh, I think, for this week. Justin, thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, I'm really interested to see how this bubble how these bubble things take off, I guess. Mm -hmm. Terrible pun, error rising. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, you know, keep us posted on how that's goes on how that goes. I'm sure there's other topics we want to talk about with you in the future. So we'll have you back uh, if you are so inclined. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for see. having me on again. I would love to come back. Yeah, and I appreciate it. I, I mentioned before you, before we started, you're a real pro is pro from a microphone and a recording and all that good stuff. So two thumbs up makes my job easier. And this um, isn't even the good let's recording see what else. computer that's back there. <laughs> <laughs> you got so many you, that you're choosing from. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm here in a Springfield Suites in Minnesota. <laughs> oh, it's, it's <laughs> with a lovely uh, mini. Can you call us a kitchen? I mean, it's got a mic. Uh, it's got a microwave and a fridge, and I don't know. It's, and drink that top water. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bare. Um, all right, let's leave it there. Um, IDACpodcast.com, Twitter at IDAC Podcast, the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at IDAC Podcast, Mastodon. IDC podcast at InfoSec John Exchange. Do all those cool things like like, subscribe, share with your friends, share with your enemies. Doesn't matter as long as people hit that button. I don't care who does it. Um, and we'll leave it there for this week. So thanks everyone for listening and or watching and we'll talk with y'all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center. <laughs>